Well, good news. Spring is finally here, but we all know that comes with the very real possibility of some very dangerous weather. Are you ready? Are we ready as a community? Stay tuned. And on Stay Tuned, you drive the discussion. We bring local experts, journalists, and civic leaders together to have tough conversations for a stronger St. Louis. Tweet us your insights on tonight's topic, and you've got a seat at the table. With a few national experts and a panel of community members, this is the show bringing more light and less heat to the issues that matter. So stay tuned. Well, when we're talking weather, the folks at the Weather Channel know it as well as anybody else, that's for sure. So let's start the show from Atlanta uh, via Google Hangout with a proud, we're proud to say, a, a product of the University of Missouri Columbia, Kate Parker with the Weather Channel in Atlanta. Kate, I, I guess maybe first, if you could just kind of tell us uh, how serious of a time of year is this? I know, I know you guys have to take this time of year seriously. Uh, we take it incredibly seriously. We've already started more planning than you can possibly imagine. It happens year round, but we make sure everybody's on board throughout the entirety of the Weather Channel. Something that a lot of folks don't realize is that Weather Company has 220 meteorologists at it, 220. So we have people around the clock that are working toward making sure that everyone is prepared going into right. tornado season, going into severe season. And you're not just there in Atlanta, you get out in the field too. I'm just curious, yes. anecdotally, can you give us an idea? I mean, I, I, do you run across more people or is it, has it changed at all? The attitudes towards preparedness, do, I mean, I, nobody ever expects it's going to happen to them, do they? That I think is the biggest problem is that there's a sense of complacency whenever it comes to preparedness and you do run across that. People don't think it's going to happen to them until it does. It goes into play from whenever you're first building your home and you're thinking about cost saving measures and you're not really thinking about what would happen if you're in the moment and you it's almost too late to wish that you had done something to mitigate your chances of having a, a major impact on a severe weather event. I know you're not just a student of weather, but a student of weather history. Can you talk a little bit about, maybe specifically too, as it pertains to the St. Louis area, how uh, our kind of our, our history is linked with severe weather and maybe that, how that kind of plays a role in the way we, we view it? There is, I think that St. Louis is fascinating. Uh, you know, I am a product of the University of Missouri, so you know I love Missouri. Um, <laughs> but St. Louis is fascinating because there was a tornado that hit um, right in the heart of what would be downtown now in 1896. And it's, it, what's fascinating is that uh, there was a paper written then, a, a large book actually, that went into what could be done to have prevented um, the catastrophic damage that occurred. And actually the most fascinating thing to me is that there was a research study that was done in 2001 and it kind of went into what would that look like today? That tornado going through downtown, what would that look like to, with today's building? Mm -hmm. And that one said about $2.6 billion in damage. That's what it would be adjusted for with current building structures um, in that area, current inflation. And then if you take 2001 numbers and put them in 2014 numbers, $3.8 billion, greater than $3.8 billion is how much damage that tornado in particular would have caused. Did, do you think, uh, did we learn anything from even 1896 that we still apply today? Well, what's interesting is that, you know, the recommendations that were made then were, hey, we should have warned people sooner. We should have gone through the avenues of even ringing bells at the fire stations. Uh, kind of an example of our modern siren system that technically doesn't have a, there's no across the board rule for the siren system across the United States. So we still haven't gotten on board on that on really truly preparing people in that regard. And is that even the best way? What role does social media play in the future mm -hmm. of um, storm preparedness and making sure people are prepared? Um, it, we could take a lot of lessons from then and still apply them today, actually. Uh, I believe, uh, if I have this right, you were here around 2006, I believe it was, when uh, we, we had some really, we had people without power for a long time during the summer. Uh, I think it was something uh, we, we call a derecho, if that's, not, if that's yeah. the right way to say it. What, what, <laughs> what is that, and what was significant about that, that summer? 
or that well, spring? Um, it, it, it's interesting that that kind of became a buzzword two years ago because of a major system that went through the Northeast. But this happened in 2006. Folks were at a Cardinals game. Mm -hmm. They were out at the game, and we had this major system blow through. And you wouldn't think that, you know, you think of a tornado being the most, you know, dangerous type of severe weather. In this circumstance, you know, there are wind gusts out ahead of that that were taking down every power line, every tree limb. There's video online that you can find of trash cans uh, swinging through the Cardinal Stadium and hitting people. I mean, just really tremendous damage happened. People were out of power. It's July 19th. And so, you know, summer in St. Louis, which is a hot tamale, yeah. and we were talking about people without power, people are passing away from heat stroke. Right, yeah, very, a very, a very tragic situa situation. Inconvenient for a lot of people, uh, it, it, deadly for some. Uh, you've covered a lot of other things. Can you, any, any other takeaways that you would like people to know when, you, when we think about uh, Joplin, for instance, or like a Good Friday tornado that we had here in, in St. Louis? Uh, what, what else comes to your mind in this topic of being prepared? The number one thing that you can do is be prepared. You have to listen to every outlet that you have. You need to listen to the Weather Channel, but also your local news outlets and stay on top of what's happening. If you don't have access to a TV, you need to be online and you need to have whatever tools you need, whatever apps you need, whether it's the Red Cross app so that you're prepared in the aftermath and the event of something unfortunate happens or if it's Weather Channel app to keep you updated during the event, you, you have to have these things in place and you have to prepare ahead of time. Um, make sure that your kids are aware of your safety plan. You know, whenever they're going off to school, you should have a plan in place for your family that is the best thing you can do to be prepared for severe weather. And honestly, you just have to stay on top of the forecast because our skills as meteorologists are getting better every day. And so, um, you know, the future looks bright for being able to give an even more warning time in advance of a tornado or a severe thunderstorm. Kay Parker, thank you so much uh, from the Weather Channel, and we'll say it for the 13th time from the University of Missouri. We appreciate yep. your time here in St. Louis. <laughs> Z-O-U. Thank you, Kate. Thanks for your time. I appreciate it. All right, let's stay right here in the studio now. Uh, let's move over here to, this, uh, we'll draw on the resources. We'll stop talking about Mizzou and start talking about Salou. How about that? From St. Louis University, uh, Professor Bob Paskin, uh, Professor of Meteo Meteorology. Um, can you give us a sense of what's unique maybe in our region? What, remind us what we're up against here, especially this time of year. Well, we're trapped, St. Louis is trapped between the Appalachian Mountains and the Rocky Mountains. And we have this great big huge pool of very warm water called the Gulf of Mexico. And so at this time of year, you get the warm, moist air coming up out of the Gulf of Mexico, being trapped in between this little funnel, and then the cold air coming out of Canada. And the net result is you have a mixture that is volatile um, to generate severe storms. And it's one of the unique places in the world where we have this combination of trapped warm air at the ground and very cold, dry air aloft and it's that combination that causes the severe storms here. Trapped is not a very good uh, way to feel. Uh, <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> Talk about um, the business that you're in of, of training folks and looking at these uh, models and indicators and things that try to give us a, a little bit of a warning. Is that changing? Are we getting better as Kate kind of um, mentioned? In, indeed, and the real problem that Kate talked about, and I work with Peter Neely, one of her um, bosses at the weather company, uh, or the weather companies actually, um, the tools that we work with now um, produce a far better forecast than they did, say, 20, 25 years ago. Um, the tools that I work with now, um, we were able to tell 12 to 18 hours in advance in 2006 that we were going to have that derecho that was going to come through St. Louis. We knew it was going to happen, and all we could do is sit and watch it happen. There wasn't anything we could do to pass out warnings. Why not? Because we are the uh, St. Louis University, we are not the National Weather Service. And by an act of Congress, only National Weather Service can issue the warnings. Um, I would not rather St. Louis University be in a position of being sued because our forecast was wrong by it, a little bit. Maybe the question I should ask you then is, d does information flow? Did everyone know it was coming? And the National Weather Service knew, um, but not with the kind of detail. Um, that we at St. Louis University knew that it was going to happen. There was an awful lot of information that we had that we tried to pass on to the National Weather Service. Um, but the kind of detail that we can do um, now with current modern tools, and it's really a shame because the National Weather Service would really love to have these tools in place as well, but there just simply is, we can't afford it. 
as a as a uh, as, as a, a nation as, as a nation as a company. I do we do we uh, our radar did change here, uh, not to Indeed. get too uh, uh, dorky on folks, but is that making things a little better? Much better, much better. We have a lot more that I can see ahead of time, um, and the warning time in the early 2000s warning for tornadoes were under five minutes, and now we can do somewhere between 20 and 25 minutes worth of, of warning. And it's not just tornadoes. What else? Well, what else? What derechios, else? hurricanes, freezing rain, an awful lot of these things that we previously did not have the ability to warn on, we now do have the ability to warn. And, and are we susceptible? Other, if I'm, I'm thinking flooding's coming to mind. We were talking watershed on the show not too many weeks ago. Indeed, because, well, I'm going to pick on my own backyard. Um, a few weeks ago, we had um, an awful heavy rain, and the ground, which was dry, is now just sucking up all of that, and the mud just rolls downhill. And I'm now digging a part of my yard out of the mud. Well, um, you're trapped and, and, and you're forced to dig, dig your way out. out. So, right. all right, uh, Professor Bob Paskin with uh, St. Louis University, we appreciate your time, uh, right. we appreciate you being here. Now, now let's go to uh, the Nine Network's Jim Kircher, who uh, paid a visit to St. Louis County's Emergency Operations Center for a look behind the scenes there. At the end of a road in Chesterfield, there's this building, St. Louis County's Emergency Operations Center. Actually, it's a building on top of a building or on top of a bunker. And Mark Diedrich was there to take us down below. Telling you the building was built in the late 1950s, uh, originally as a nuclear fallout shelter. Uh, it was designed to hold 75 people for two weeks. Uh, the idea was if there was a nuclear attack in St. Louis, the mayor of the city of St. Louis and the county executive and their staff would come out here and operate city and county government. And this is... This, this is a fallout shelter door. Right? This is actually the front door at the time. It's from uh -huh. an old submarine. Because we're uh, two stories underground, uh, encased in 24-inch concrete. So it's not just really the, the structure that's an issue. It's really your communication system. It's being staying in touch. And right? really, that's what we're all about. We get information from the field, and then we send information out to the field. And you've got sort of a command center here? Okay. This is here for all kinds of disasters and emergencies. Earthquakes, floods, maybe not an air raid, but maybe a terrorist attack, a chemical spill, or more likely in this area, a tornado. St. Louis has had plenty of experiences, plenty of losses because of severe weather. 1896 was the worst in terms of lives lost and property damage. This tornado went through Lafayette Square and Soulard, skipped over the river, and roared through East St. Louis. 1927's tornado, this one went through neighborhoods in the middle of the day, hitting schools and a hospital. In 1959, a tornado came in the winter after most people had gone to bed. We had the Good Friday tornado in 2011. That's the one that did so much damage at Lambert Airport. And just this month, a weak tornado in University City that seemed to come out of nowhere. In that storm in University City, I'm confident that's where that tornado started. So there was no time to see that the tornado had begun and then get the warning out. And I can even tell you from my perspective, the storm that we knew was coming in in the morning was not the one that was worrying us. The one that was worrying us was the storm that was coming in later that night. That just goes to show you can't always predict what weather's going to do and how it's going to react. When the Weather Service issues a tornado warning, somewhere here or at the 911 Operations Center, somebody presses a button. Actually, they click a mouse and sets off the sirens. It's got to drive you nuts when people will rush to the window when the sirens go off to see if they're going to see anything. <laughs> That's exactly what happens a large uh, amount of the time. Uh, I jokingly refer to it as the Great Neighborhood Meet and Greet Program. The sirens go off. A lot of times the neighbors come out to their front porch and start talking to each other. It doesn't look bad here, and that may be the case. But really what we're trying to do is give you as much warning as we possibly can. Uh, and really the first thing that you should do when you hear those sirens or you hear your weather radio go off is to head to the basement and then find out where the storm is. A highlight of this tour is the old fallout shelter emergency exit. If the building above collapsed, the stairway blocked, this was the way out. They won't be giving this tour much longer. The county has built a new emergency operations center. Modern, bigger, better. We can hope we'll never need it. But we know 
we almost certainly will. For Stay Tuned, I'm Jim Kircher. Thanks to Jim Kircher for that. Let's uh, talk what does preparedness look like with a couple of uh, gentlemen who, who know and think about this kind of stuff on our behalf largely a lot of times. Let me do introductions. Dale Chambers, Public Safety Administrator, St. Louis Area Regional Response System. That's with East West, East West Gateway. And Matt Hun, he's with the Army Corps of Engineers Emergency Management. I guess I'll start by saying what, what comes to your uh, minds when we, when we say natural disaster? What, what does that mean to you? Well, for natural disasters, um, it's tornadoes, it's floods, um, but it could certainly be a windstorm, and in our region, an earthquake as well. And how often do you think people are thinking about this kind of thing? Is the general public prepared? We hope they're prepared. I mean, it's, it's, it's a topic that we talk about all the time, that we talk about with our families and friends, not just in the office. It's, it's part of the, our daily efforts to do that. But is it, a, is it a tough sell, though? I mean, I, I'm, I'm curious if, you know, you got to go to the grocery store, pick up the kids, you know, make, uh, make pay your bills. Is this really something that you feel like we are prepared as a region for? I believe that we're underprepared as much as we try to prepare uh, individually and as a region, um, whether that's a government agency or a nonprofit agency that supports all of those operations. It's... it's Unfortunately, it's just not enough. Um, we as a, as a society have to change our culture and, and our mm -hmm. culture of thinking of being prepared. We're such a reactive culture that um, it doesn't happen to me. And instead we need to be on the, well, it will happen to me and let's, what, what can we do to prepare for that? So when something does happen, we have a tornado like we've already had one this spring, it may seem like a reaction to those of us on the outside looking in, but, I'm, but it's not, I'm gathering. What, what happens when something hits the ground? Well, when the disaster hits, and, and working for the Army Corps of Engineers as a federal agency, we're here to support the state and local communities. We're not down on the ground knocking on people's doors right off the bat, but we're definitely on the phone calling the state saying, hey, if you need our help, we're there, and in turn, we provide that sort of support. But as far as when you start looking at tornadoes or flooding and everything else, everybody looks at it, well, in, in St. Louis, what's everybody do? They run to the grocery store and buy their bread and milk when they think they're going to get the warning. We love our French toast. We do. And, but that's not enough. I mean, it's got to be, where do we live at? And some of the, uh, lately, in the last few weeks, we've heard what? We've heard the uh, MSDs put the bid out, out on the radio. Know your zone, know your flood. So other communities are doing this, and we're all talking about it. How do we get that word out? How do we talk about that? And from my perspective, as I'm going long-winded here, that's is okay. the part that, that we, we talk about a disaster hits. We talk about the, the tornadoes. We talk about Joplin. We talk about the 2011 flooding. The 2013 flood event was the fourth highest flood on record in St. Louis. How many people knew about it? I mean, there were a lot of, a lot of agencies and a lot of people working to keep people safe. So you've got a very short window after that where everybody kind of goes, oh, gee, it's really bad. And then, okay, complacency takes over and they go back to their normal life. They, they, we go out and pick up our weather radios right after a tornado, but not, uh, not, not, at, not as the time goes on, perhaps. Well, it's important to keep them plugged in and batteries plugged in them. It's, uh, you know, keep them on and active and where you can use them. So just owning one is not going to serve any purpose if it's not uh, on and useful. Why, why is this important to the East-West Gateway? What, 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 what's the stake? Well, as, as part of the St. Louis urban area, it's it's a collaborative partnership. I mean, we all have to work together. A tornado doesn't just land on a single block in St. Louis City. It tends to want to cross county lines, uh, cross the river into state lines. And so it, as a collaboration, we need to work together and so that we're all on the same page. We're trained together, that uh, we have equipment that's similar uh, in the best ways we can, and plans that, that we can work together. Oftentimes, states have their own laws and you have to work behind the scenes to, to help change those laws or to adapt them so that they can um, work together qu more quickly. And, and, be, and, and does this go beyond governments, beyond municipalities? I mean, is, there, is there a role for business? Is there a role for, obviously we've talked about individuals, but other community organizations? Are you, is that something that you guys try to coordinate with as well or that you think needs to have a, a better coordination? On this be, be in on this conversation? Oh, th they already are on this conversation. And I think that um, businesses do need to pick up a lot more of, um, be more interested in, in this philosophy because so much of our infrastructure across the country is 
small business or large business in that in, for infrastructure, but certainly small business, it's the economics behind uh, the country that needs to prepare for uh, anything that's going to happen. And, and, that, and that's a, a mistake that a lot of people tend to take. They, you look at the 2011 flooding and people looked at it and they said, well, gee, it's a bunch of farmers across uh, you know, South Dakota and Nebraska and Kansas and Missouri and who cares? But when you start taking in and looking at that, and, and I worked, uh, I was working with FEMA at the time trying to address some of the response efforts and the recovery efforts on that. And you start taking and you say, well, this school and then this town and then this county's impacted. And then my family took a vacation. Where'd we go? We went up north and along the Missouri River. So you started seeing all the impacts to, the, to our nation as a whole. So there, preparedness is, is where we make the opportunity, but it's, it's preparing for that disaster that nobody wants to see. And as Dale was saying, we, we all work behind the scenes sometimes because people don't want to talk about it when the, when the sun's shining and the weather's good. Mm -hmm. We need to prepare for that. Last question, Dad, have you seen the attitudes shift at all in the right direction? I, I think from a relationship standpoint, in uh, 2008, we stood up, the Corps of Engineers stood up the Interagency Levy Task Force, which was kind of a change in way of doing things. It forced. It forced other federal agencies to come together along with the state and these non-governmental org organizations to come together at one group to address these problems. And we started talking, because it's about the relationships that are formed when everything's good. When the sun's shining, we're talking to one another. And then when it hits and everything goes bad, then we can work together and, and provide for the public safety. Matt Hunt, thank you for your time. Dale Chambers, thank you as well. Uh, we appreciate your insights tonight. Uh, don't forget, we'd like to hear what you have to say about this as well. So find us on social media, hashtag stay tuned STL. And in the meantime, we stopped by a blood drive recently to find a very unique way to prepare for a disaster. When a disaster strikes, it's the blood that's on the shelves now that's going to help patients in need. Uh, and so, you know, if people look outside and it's a bright sunny day, they don't see inclement weather, they don't hear about anything on the news, they don't really think about donating blood. They don't think about it until after that disaster has taken place. Absolutely. Uh, we have a great partnership with the Zombie Squad because their, their mission is very much in line with the Red Cross mission, which is uh, to help people in need. And so when the, when the Zombie Squad appro approached the American Red Cross and said we'd like to host a blood drive, it was a no-brainer for us to say yes. It's, it's a fun way of getting people involved. Tell people, hey, yeah, just come out for a blood drive. They're like, oh, yeah, we'll do that, you know, next time. Hey, come donate blood. The zombie apocalypse is coming. Okay, yeah, that makes more sense. Zombie Squad is a disaster preparedness organization, and we use zombies as a metaphor for all the things that might go wrong in the world. You know, uh, natural disasters, man-made disasters, uh, you know, whatever. Uh, zombies are, are a decent metaphor. You know, they, if you're prepared for zombies to rise from the grave and try and eat your face, you're probably ready for a tornado or an earthquake or what have you. So Zombie Squad started back in around 2004 with a bunch of guys watching terrible zombie movies in the basement of their house and saying, man, the zombies are coming, why would you, you, know, why would you go in there? You don't have any food, you don't have anything in there, you know, you're all going to get eaten. You know, we, th we thought, well, maybe we, could, maybe we could do this and we could use this as a vehicle to get people interested in disaster preparedness. Because, you know, if you talk to the Red Cross, if you talk to FEMA, it's, it's boring. No one, you know, no one likes to talk about disaster preparedness. When you figure only about 38% of the population is eligible to donate blood, and yet less than 10% actually do, you start to realize just how important every single one of these blood drives are and how important every single donation is. Every single blood donation we receive has the potential to help save up to three lives. Being prepared can mean different things for different people and, and be uh, more of a challenge for some than others. Let's talk about that with our folks at the table. Uh, right now I want to do some introductions of David Newberger, uh, Commissioner of the Office on the Disabled for the City of St. Louis. Thanks for being here. And Nicole Hawkins, Regional Director of Preparedness, Red Cross St. Louis Region. And you both are uh, involved in something called the All Ready Initiative. Um, maybe let's start right there. What is, what, what is the All Ready Initiative? We, uh, I, this started in, in, from my thinking about the needs of people with disabilities uh, to be able to protect themselves in the case of an emergency. And we worry uh, uh, that folks with disabilities are going to be the second group that's looked at. If, if you, I always use the example if you have a fire in a building and you, get, uh, you have five stories and you have, empty everybody out 
and you uh, evacuate everybody, then you go back and see who's lost, and the guy on the fifth floor in the wheelchair is sitting there. So it's very important that we, uh, people who are disabled and also other people, uh, people who don't speak English and so forth, that we have a plan for ourselves because the system cannot Im immediately serve everybody. The, the word all implies it's more than uh, just those with disabilities, but also there are, I guess, does this preparedness, we talk about the word disparity comes up on a lot of shows that we do. Is there a disparity in, in, in who is prepared or who has the, uh, the help getting prepared? Yeah, actually one of the reasons we decided to do this, uh, it's, it's not only our two agencies, but several others who've come together to do this initiative is we did a survey of people uh, versus the general population and people who had a disability and found that the people with a disability were very much underprepared from the general population who is also underprepared. So that, that's a big issue for us. So we're really trying to make sure that people understand that they have their own personal responsibility and what can we do to help them understand that and be able to, to jump on that and get working on it. One of the uh, important features of this, when you're talking about people with disabilities, the needs of people with disabilities can differ from the kind of disability they have. Uh, you know, a NOAA radio doesn't work well for a blind or for a deaf person. Uh, and so if you can have a bed shaker and when the NOAA radio goes off, the bed is shake, the person wakes up and goes and turns on the television. The, the NOAA radio works great for a blind person, but if you have a disaster, power lines down, uh, God forbid, an, or an earthquake, the, the path that the person is used to walking on becomes dangerous, and that person can't see that. So he needs a plan or she needs a plan to uh, work with their neighbors in order to figure out what their escape is. So, so the need for preparedness becomes different from the need for the general population. Who, who else would you like to see involved in this preparation? Right now we have, we're doing a great campaign where we're working with the independent living centers. So Paraquad, Link, some of those people to train their clients on how to be more prepared. So their staff members working with them, not in a presentation manner, but in a conversational way and how do you build it into everyday life. So we're really working on a culture shift. So we're reaching out to other organizations that work with people who have a functional or access need, whatever that might be, to kind of engage in this training process so that we can get more and more people um, prepared. And, you know, and you're not just talking, I'm guessing, about the high-rises either. I mean, this is something that can be oh, rural yeah. areas it's, as well. Yeah, I mean, uh, very people need, from whatever situation they're in, they need to be able to protect themselves. Uh, I wanted to pick up on something that Nicole said because I'm very proud of the Red Cross in, in one of the things that they've done. They've worked out a training program with all the different kinds of disabilities and they can go into an organization like the MS Society or uh, the Missouri Council for the Blind, and they can help the, the people who work, who, who provide services uh, to their population to train them on how they can train people so that it becomes people helping people. And one of the things that we say uh, in the disability world is nothing about us without us. So we wanna make sure that somebody who is blind is doing the training for people who are blind so that it becomes a much more personal, real thing. What role do neighbors have? I know if you live in a high rise, you have an emergency plan that may say something like uh, mm -hmm. each floor has a captain who knocks on Sure. certain person's door. Is there a role for neighbors, high rise or otherwise? Absolutely. I mean, we ask people if you have a disability or not, you should know your neighborhood. One of the biggest factors in a resiliency of a community is social connectedness. And it's how well you know your neighbors, how well you're connected to your community. And that's for anyone, regardless of your abilities or disabilities. So if somebody knows their neighbors and they know there's a storm coming and they can check on them and I have a basement and you might need help getting down there, helping someone out can save a life. And that's what we're trying to do. We're not trying to just prepare people, we're saving lives. We mentioned 2006 earlier in the show when the power was out. Were there lessons learned there as pertains to what we're talking about here? When you go several days without electricity for say an elevator. Right, well, I mean, we have a power issue, of course, because many people with disabilities need power. It's not only for running a wheelchair, but sometimes it's for running a ventilator. Uh, and a person ha is running that off batteries, and if they can't charge them, then they're in trouble. So that they really need uh, a, f a method that they're, they're gonna protect themselves. One, one of the things that I would say is that their emergency preparedness kit ought to have uh, additional batteries. So 
they can go a little bit longer and maybe somebody can carry with the batteries that are used to some place where there is power and then trade them off and, and, and indeed that happened in Sandy and a lot of other cases. And to David's point, it's not just uh, somebody with a physical disability. Imagine someone who needs insulin and is diabetic and then their refrigerator isn't working and how do they keep that cool? So it's just thinking ahead, those little steps that can really make a difference. Okay, we'll pick this conversation up a little bit more later in the show, but first uh, we I want to get to uh, our next guest, uh, who there was probably the most heavily covered natural disaster in recent memory would be the tornado in Joplin. Well, one filmmaker did some coverage of the coverage. Uh, we have her coming up next, but first let's take a look at a clip of her award-winning work, Deadline in Disaster. Joplin Globe, they showed up Monday morning with a huge stack of papers and it was, it's just gone. And I thought, how did they get it so fast? Not knowing that they suffered some severe tragedy too, but they just, they were right there on the spot and having the paper arrive every single day. Just you don't expect that. As a clip from Deadline in Disaster, the producer of that film is Beth Pike, and she joins us on the Hangout now. Beth, welcome to the show. I guess just tell us a little bit about this film. How, how did this come about? Well, thanks, Casey. I really appreciate being here. Um, the film basically came about, uh, I was sent down to cover the tornado by CBS News. So the night of the tornado, I was going down there, traveling down there, getting in with my satellite truck the next morning, realizing at that point the impact of what had happened. And uh, following our first uh, live coverage, the first thing I did was go to the Red Cross Center. And there was the Joplin Globe and all these people who had lost their homes, many of them probably even lost loved ones, were all had the newspaper and were going on about how the newspaper was able to publish and here they were looking through and finding information about what happened. And uh, then I learned that the the Joplin Globe had suffered quite, quite a few losses themselves. They, uh, their page designer was killed in the storm, the person who lays out the newspaper. Uh, one third of their staff lost their homes, their cars, their ability to get to work. But somehow they did not miss deadline. They were publishing every day. And so one of the persons we actually interviewed for CBS that evening was Jeff Lear, who was a crime reporter who lost his home lost his cat and had just somehow miraculously survived in a closet in, the, uh, you know, in his house with everything else gone. And uh, so, so, so that was kind of the genesis of it. And by day two or three, I had talked with a good friend of mine who uh, covers uh, Associated Press or had retired from the AP and who had given me some contact leads and said, you know, this story of the Joplin Globe really ought to be told at some point, you know, and it, but it needs to be told soon while this is all yeah. happening. So we contacted the Missouri Press Association, which had funded a previous documentary of ours, and uh, they graciously agreed, said, yes, let's, let's do this. And so right away, we had another photographer, my co-director, Steve Hudnall, who came up to Joplin, immediately started getting footage. Um, and we were there for about six months on and off, but uh, following the globe around uh, in terms of, uh, you know, kind of being uh, kind of, uh, a camera on them without them right. maybe necessarily knowing we were always there. I mean, we were just, we try not to be too they, they got accustomed to you being there. <laughs> right, exactly. Uh, what did you see how, uh, change? Uh, how did these journalists uh, change over the time that you were there as they were covering the disaster they, were, they themselves were also vic <laughs> victims of? Right, right. Well, what I did see, first of all, was this incredible uh, desire that they needed to be there. They needed to be there covering. It was their mission, their job. It was what they could do to contribute, just like a firefighter or a police officer. I mean, that they were part of that front line and they needed to hold up and, and do their job. Um, so that was the first thing, was how important they felt like it was that they do their job and do it well. And there were a lot of things they had to do there. They had to, one, help the community mourn its losses because that was really the immediate thing. Um, people wanted to know who was killed in the storm, um, just just the whole what had happened, the extent of it, and they were there to cover it. Then they also had to then, you know, make sure that their uh, 
they became the watchdog for the community because all this money was being poured in and was the help getting to where it needed to be. So they had all these different roles that they had to take you know, soon after the storm hit, and they still continue today. Um, and that was a role they took very seriously. They, a lot of them put a lot of their personal issues behind and felt like they needed to be there to serve their readers. I know from uh, spending some time covering Hurricane Katrina that when it's yeah. that large, everyone has been affected, everyone has a story, and no one has anyone to talk to that doesn't almost have a competing story, for lack of a better word. Did you, did you find that to be the case in, in, in Joplin as well? And, and how did that affect that professionalism you're talking about? Right. Well, everybody, everybody at that paper knew somebody that was lost in the store, but if they were killed, if they were severely injured, if their home was gone, there was not one person who wasn't affected. And so uh, I think that, you know, just like the community, they all had to kind of help each other, support each other in that, in that role. And so many people, as you know, in Joplin stepped up. It was just a, kind of an amazing community to see how they pulled together and, uh, you know, carried on. Have you been back? I have. I have. Um, you know, we were there for those first six months, pretty intense, and then I came back for the anniversary. And uh, I guess I've been back a couple of times since then, and it's been wonderful seeing, you know, so much uh, progress being made. And and Even, and, and yeah. I, I was going to say, what about inside the newsroom? What? Right. How, how has oh, it changed? Absolutely, absolutely. The newsroom's gotten a lot closer. I think they realized, um, you know, just how much they did need each other and how much they supported one another and and how important their role is, uh, whether it was, you know, sports, even sports had a role because, you know, people kind of wanted to get back to, to just, uh, you know, everyday living. And so, so you know, every, every department, circulation on, all had important roles to play. And I think they all realized how interconnected they are and how much they needed each other and supported each other. They're, they're a tight group, much tighter today. I don't think this is the first kind of disaster that you've covered, and, and maybe not even natural disaster. Sometimes, uh, you know, horrific events that are that are caused by criminal acts. What what have you what have you learned about communities that kind of uh, suffer together? The resilience. Well, just this week, I was uh, NBC News had me in, in Overland Park, Kansas, for the shootings, and I I ended up spending a lot of the time with both families of the victims and not just the victims families but just even community members and uh, you know the one thing that I think does happen is that people really strangers I, I went I, real late at night I was uh, had an eight all day and I went through a, a fast food place and everybody was so nice to each other I mean everybody was still kind of re reeling from what had happened and there was just a sense of just patience with one another seriously concern and care and I, I observed that in uh, Kansas City earlier this week. That yeah. everybody was everybody was mourning, not just the families. Beth Pike, uh, producer of Deadline and Disaster, thank you for your time and uh, for reminding us why it's so important to be prepared. We appreciate your time. Well, thank you, and I might also thank KETC. They also aired the documentary uh, a year after it was made. So thank you for doing that as well. Absolutely. Appreciate it. Thanks, Beth. We appreciate it. Thank you. Let's uh, kind of stay on this theme. Uh, J.B. Forbes, uh, photographer with the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, thanks for being here, my Certainly. friend. Certainly, glad uh, to be here. Um, you too were in Joplin. Yes, I was. Uh, shooting uh, pictures, as you do for the paper. But I want to start back just a few hours before that tornado hit. R tell folks kind of your personal experience and, and, and where you were right before that tornado hit. Well, I have relatives. My wife's family lives in Parsons, Kansas, which is 60 miles west of Joplin. So we had been, we had spent the weekend in Parsons and we passed through Joplin on the way home. So we came through about 1230 that Sunday and I remember distinctly that there, it was sunny, it was humid, there were some fluffy clouds but other than that it, there was no sense of urgency or, or uh, impending disaster. We came up 44 and somewhere close to uh, St. Louis my niece who lives in Joplin texted us and said, I'm okay. And we texted back and said, okay from what? And we never got a response. And so when I pulled into my driveway, my son came running out, said, Dad, get in here and look at the Weather Channel. And I took one look at the Weather Channel, got on the phone, talked to my photo editor and said, I'm going back. And some of the photos that we're seeing right now, that's some of the work that you uh, produced when you got there. 
What, yes. What stands out? What, what was the what impression stand out when you first saw the, what was when the sun came up, perhaps? Well, the first impression was uh, we drove back, but after spending the day and I was already worn out, um, we stopped at the uh, along the highway until it started to get light. We drove on into Joplin, and I was at ground zero when the sun came up. Got out of the car, and I walked about 50 feet, and there in front of me was. Uh, the legs of a woman sticking out from underneath a tree. And uh, I knew then and there that this was going to be the worst thing that I had ever seen. What does that do to you as a journalist? Uh, generally, you have to steel yourself for events like that, and you certainly can't become too emotionally involved. But when you see something of this magnitude, I, I had never seen. I, I've covered many a disaster. And, You've been and, to war zones. Yes, and many, uh, many a tornado and earthquakes and hurricanes, but the, the extent of that disaster was really something. And then the next day, uh, the National Guard provided a helicopter for many of us, and so I was up over the city and was just amazed at the uh, extent of the damage. I was sitting next to Al Roker, who was there for the Weather Channel, and, and all of us were just speechless as we looked out and saw it looked like somebody had taken a large hand and just clawed their way right through the center of Joplin. So, and which by the way, the mayor I've heard say recently, you can still see even with the rebuilding and with the, re, with the regrowth, mm -hmm. there's still that scar that goes right through their city. Mm -hmm. We are so easily distracted and, and there's so much uh, information, if you want to call it that, coming at us at all times. Uh, what is your role in that s situation to bring, it, it, is it hard to bring something like that home to let people know just how serious it is, like you're saying now? No, I think it's very important to let people know. And uh, it was through our pictures that immediately ran in the Post-Dispatch along with the stories that uh, people could see the extent of the damage, hear the personal stories, and uh, volunteers step forward almost immediately and, and people see that and say, what can I do to help? You did something else with your pictures as well. Uh, tell me about that. Well, this, uh, this did affect me more than a lot of the events that I've covered. So um, myself, along with uh, Robert Cohen, who also went down there from the Post, uh, we decided to try and do something above and beyond just our, our coverage. We didn't want it to end just with the pictures in the Post. So we organized a, a benefit auction and the Regional Arts Commission here in St. Louis um, was nice enough to donate the space. We got uh, discounts on the printing and the framing. We had a, a wonderful event. We made some money for Joplin and we were able to send it down there to the relief effort. And then afterwards, uh, I took the pictures and uh, a lot of people donated them back to me and said, do with them what you will. And, and I took them back and uh, donated them to the mayor in Joplin. Did this uh, change? Were you a prepared man already, or did this change the way you think about uh, preparing for the unknown? Um, good question. I, I, I think I, 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 you just have to move, yeah. <laughs> is the way it comes down to it. Very good. You have to be ready to go. J.B. Forbes, thanks for your time. and Absolutely. Uh, thanks for your work. We appreciate it. All right, uh, let's check so social media, see what you're staying with the hashtag. Talk a little bit about the future here, if we could. Uh, not flying cars, but what we need to do to be ready in these situations. Uh, introductions first would be Shante Fluellen Hayes, Program Manager, Department of Public Health, uh, specifically focusing on severe weather protection, and Gary Chrisman, Commissioner for the Emergency Management Agency from the St. Louis City side. Um, wh what can people do now to be prepared? Uh, God forbid anything else ever happen like, like it did in Joplin. I think it's important for people to have a clear understanding of the impacts of these extreme weather events. 
what types of events that we have, extreme weather events that we have that occur locally, as well as the health impacts that may occur, primary being death due to cold, heat exposure, uh, flooding, tornadoes, and then secondary being uh, increase in incidence of asthma or other respiratory illnesses due to like an extended period of, of, of heat or something of that nature. Um, I think that uh, after which, once they have this understanding of the, the types of events that we have and the health impacts, then they have the ability to better plan what they need to do to best prepare for their, themselves and their families, um, what things that they would need to consider in a kit, and um, the importance of staying informed um, about the situation as it's occurring as well. I don't remember when the little earthquake quake, uh, hit in southeast Missouri. This has been 20 some years ago, I guess now. But I remember it was pretty popular to have your kit under the stairwell after the earthquake shook the ground just a little bit. Yes. Do people do that anymore? Have we forgotten about that? Do we, are we, do we really have fresh flash uh, batteries in our flashlights? I think after a disaster or after you know something that happens close to home, people do become prepared. They do build the kits, but after a time, they start getting a little more complacent. The kits start dwindling away, the food starts expiring, and a lot of people don't take the, the needed steps to make sure that they're prepared. But I think a lot of what we're seeing also is, is there's been so many devastating tornadoes and events that have happened in the last couple of years. The individuals that I've talked to at neighborhood meetings and other um, get-togethers have really expressed that they are starting to get more prepared. They want to know how they can be prepared. They actually are putting those kits together and they're actually getting no weather radios to make sure that they are prepared because you, know, you guys are reporting on it and they're starting to see that these are deadly tornadoes. Is it, it hard? Happen. Is it is it hard to get people uh, excited? May not be the right word, but uh, engaged. I think once an event occurs, or for example, when we've had we've had the uh, the extreme weather that we had during the winter, mm -hmm. it was easier to to bring up the issue or the importance of developing a kit and being prepared and making those plans because it was at the fore. These things directly impacted them during these events and so I think that uh, with the frequency that we're having these extreme weather events I think it will be a little bit more it'll 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 help us to um, to to help to uh, provide that shift to a culture of resiliency within our communities in the region right, what are you seeing are you seeing I'm speaking of kind of the culture of things I had a gentleman just tell me today he uh, he started out he got cert trained uh, now he leads a cert uh, teaching group. I don't think he was offering me a breath mint. I think he meant. I think he meant something else. I'm sorry. Nothing from the gallery back there. Um, <laughs> he was. CERT uh, is what and how and how is that growing and playing a role in this conversation? CERT is the Citizens Emergency Response Training. Um, it actually came out of California following a number of earthquakes. And what we find is is that, you know, we talk about our traditional first responders, which would be the police department, the fire department, emergency medical services. Really, it is the citizen because they're the ones that are on the scene first. So what we try to do is we offer them this CERT training to get them prepared on how to deal with um, minor fires, how to do basic first aid, how to do basic search and rescue, and also how to build those kits, how to have an emergency kit. Do you have a location where your family will meet up if we have that earthquake? Do you have an out of town contact that you have for everybody in the family because a lot of times you can make long distance calls but you can't make local calls. So this kind of puts all that training together over a 72 hour period and then you can bring it into your neighborhoods, build CERT teams, you can bring it into your work, you can bring it into to universities and it helps people be prepared and understand why it's important to be prepared. It, has, it been, has, it, has this been successful and helpful? I mean it sounds like it might have kind of tapped into a, a desire but maybe people, people didn't know where to put those energies. Is it helping? It, it has, and we've really got a number of CERT programs that are going on around the region. Um, we work together, but we do have independent CERT programs uh, for St. Louis County, St. Louis uh, City, St. Charles, and other areas, and it helps people make sure that they're prepared. And when we talk about preparedness, it's not just be prepared at home. Be prepared at work. Be prepared at, you know, where if you're at church, 
on vacation, and everybody in your family needs to have that kid have as a, well. Have a plan for your kids while they're at school without you. Absolutely, absolutely. And then also your pets. You hmm. know, do you have a kit for your pets? Do you have food? Do you have kitty litter? Do you have treats? Because a lot of times, and we know, people are not going to leave their homes without their pets. We need to make sure that they have provisions for their pets. So if we do have to shelter them, we have that starting point. Uh, let's take a quick break. Uh, we want to bring everybody that's been on the show back to the table and see what that conversation looks like. Uh, I think we have, might have some ideas that we've skipped over or we want to kind of uh, expand upon. Uh, but in the meantime, we'll take a look at uh, what you're saying online and when we come back, we'll have more people at the table. Nicole, I want to. I'll just kind of want to start with you. Uh, what what has been uh, going on back there in the conference room that people have been talking about that we need to get out here and share with everyone? You know what? We've been congrat congratulating everyone on how great we're doing, <laughs> but we're also talking a lot about um, you know everyone else's topics. So I'm adding things about what they're talking about and they're talking about. So what? So what? Do, I guess my question is, what have we missed tonight? And, and anyone, feel free to jump in here. Uh, JB, come in close. I don't feel like you're too far away. Um, so I know one of the big things we're talking about is storms, but I think we also haven't really mentioned fire safety. So the disaster that we have most often is single family fires in our region and they kill the most people and cause the most property damage, which is a really big deal. Uh, you know, we never want to lose a life. So that's also something we can talk about. It's really well, important. and, and, I, and that reminds me then too maybe of uh, a different demographic age wise too, just down here on Lindell. Uh, two years ago maybe we had an apartment that b burned and displaced a lot of college students that Yes. Uh, they may have grabbed their laptops, but if they didn't grab their ATM card, they didn't have anything. Right. Is that something you guys deal with too in terms of a, 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 are, certain, are certain populations fragile that you might not think are? A absolutely. When we look at all hazards, we don't just focus on weather. We look at man-made events. We look at natural events, technological mm -hmm. events. But we also make sure that it's not just the individual, but it's you know, those that are at sp sporting events. Um, how are they going to take care of their patrons that are at those events? Businesses, how are you going to take care of yourself at a business? But, you know, as we were talking about, severe weather is one part of many things that we have to worry about here in the St. Louis area. We've got many different hazards, earthquakes, flooding, fires, um, ice storms, weather related. So we have to be prepared for all those different events and understand that those can happen any time throughout the year. It's not just a spring event. It's not just a summer event. We've had tornadoes on New Year's Eve. Yes, we have. The great thing is being prepared for one thing makes you prepared for almost everything else. It's just a small tweak, so it doesn't have to feel like a ton of extra work. Exactly. To Gary's point, you really don't have to feel like you have to make a distinct kit and plan for every single thing. It's just tweaking what you do a little bit. Yeah, Professor, we were talking about that wind that was coming towards Bush Stadium in 2006. I don't know, were, do, do you all remember that? It was on the security video that you could see the wind coming through there. Were you... Uh, grimacing when you saw that and and did we have changed anything I'm not not picking on the Cardinals but just in general with public gatherings H has anything changed from that yeah yeah there, there's been a lot that has changed since that event uh, the Cardinals have done a remarkable job of making their stadium storm ready uh, they've got designated severe thunderstorm shelter areas tornado shelters and they've tied a lot of the the appliances down so they don't get blown around during those events Along with the city, we learned a lot of you know valuable lessons dealing with a heat emergency, and then having an extensive power outage. You know how do we respond to those? We learn from every disaster, but we also learn from disasters around the country. We don't wait for them just to happen here. And one of the things I wanted to circle back on was the kits. 
We also have to make sure that we personalize those kits, don't just buy it off the shelf, but also update them. Every time that you change your clock for daylight savings time, change the battery in your smoke detector, update the uh, emergency oh, response kit as well. Absolutely. Guilty, we're both yeah. guilty. <laughs> it's and, our creative and, minds. <laughs> and that goes back to, uh, on FEMA's website, not that I'm touting FEMA's website, but it, it is a great website. It's got a lot of good things on, on ready.gov. It talks about that, and some of the, the news, uh, they've been putting uh, advertisements out there talking about trying to get the kids involved, and that's a lot of it. And there are family uh, disaster preparedness plan. It's a great thing, and I, and I know when I heard that, I went, looked at my kids and said, hmm, kids, we need to talk. So you bring everybody in, and it's, it's, it's a good involvement. I'm going to go back to, to Gary and, and the baseball stadium. Um, one of the biggest problems that the Cardinals have, and I've been working with the Cardinals on a lightning mapping array to protect the, the stadium against lightning, the question becomes how do you get people to actually respond, that you have the guy who's been told, that there's a lightning strike, so he takes his aluminum umbrella and holds it up further in the air. How do you get that kind of person to get undercover and listen and pay attention? An awful lot of people don't pay attention to those kinds of warnings. And Gary and I were talking about the fact that with the tornado sirens going off, a lot of people simply ignore them now. Um, some of the older people, if you will, the all clear signal um, that went on. A lot of that technology is old and people are moving on to newer technology, but nonetheless, that's still an invaluable piece of equipment that keeps people aware. I don't think we've commented uh, yet on the question of how much preparedness should you have. Uh, I think that some agencies say that you should be prepared for 72 hours before any responder gets to you so that you can be taken care of. Some of us believe you better think about a week because it can be a long time. Uh, and so when we talk about these preparedness kits, they need to be robust and as I said earlier, they need to uh, be personalized to the individual and the individual circumstances. But, you know, maybe facetiously, but sometimes I say you better be prepared. And her husband said, no, you ought to stay here. And the sirens go off so often that it was just one more siren. But they went ahead and turned on the TV and then they could see what was going on. And the second uh, uh, siren went off and then they knew and uh, they could see the wall cloud and it got very dark and they dove for cover and uh, had to hang on to each other just to keep from getting sucked out of their house. Yeah, I found that just being down there, there was definitely a, an attitude of uh, we, we, uh, we know what we're doing. Kind of like almost like the uh, mentality of the hurricane watch party mm -hmm. where, where people ride those out. Different storms, though. Yeah, research is showing that just like in your situation, it, when someone tells you, when you have a reinforcement in, a, in addition to the, the sirens, when your husband tells you or your friend calls you and says, this is serious, you should take action, people will take action more more promptly. So I think what that means is we all have to take care of each other, right? Yeah, that's fascinating. That, that's worked on me, and I've seen it work on my friends when I've called them. Yep. You know, and there's also so many different media outlets out there to get warnings, to get information. You know, we try to educate people. When you get up in the morning, when you're getting dressed, getting ready to go to work, find out what the weather's gonna do. Do you need to bring an umbrella? Or are you gonna have to worry about tornadoes? You know, make sure that you're prepared, not just surprised when that alarm goes off. I can recommend a fantastic television station with an excellent weather team if anyone wants to, <laughs> to tune in. I, I know even people at the Post watch Channel 5 for their weather, so. Um, and we're, we're on the web now, by the way, so anything else you guys wanna say that we haven't touched on? Yeah. Definitely. Uh, as far as making sure that there's information and understanding out in the community, uh, the program that I'm in definitely takes advantage of any types of outreach opportunities, whether it be health fairs. Um, a lot of times I've been invited to come to speak at different functions in order to, to get more information out about the extreme weather events that we experience, as well as um, uh, reaching out to children. You know, start, starting young with the understanding of what types of impacts that we can experience and what they can do to play a part in, in building a more resilient community as well, too. So I think that those are definitely two key components, mm -hmm. getting that information out there. And if I could add something to that as well, you know, we're talking about preparedness before the storm hits. Absolutely. People have to understand what's going to happen after the storm. They may not have drinking water. They may not have sewage. They may not have food for a period of time, as we've talked about, but how do you rebuild your life? 
learn from those events that have happened to other people and find out what emotions did they go through? How did they deal with that? How do we get back to some form of normalcy? Dale, final thought. Oh, a final thought. <laughs> Just, you know, what's, what's on your mind? It doesn't, have, you don't, don't feel pressure. Oh, no pressure at all <laughs> from this crowd. But um, no, it is, it, you know, we think um, in emergency management, we think local, uh, you know, every disaster starts local and ends local. And preparedness has to be that same way, is that we have to start with an individual, move to the family, move to the, to the neighborhood, make sure you know who your neighbor is, make sure that they have what they need in case of, a, of an emergency. And then you go up to the school that's, that's in your neighborhood, then the, the next building, the next building, and then it gets into a bigger community, the community goes into a region, and then we get, and then it comes back to you, okay, that started out all over again with the next round. And I think that's where we really have to be, um, just changing our, our mental focus to be on the front end of that. I had one last thought. Is it, it, so I'm thinking, you know, um, I can see how my sister and brother-in-law have changed with the addition to their family with their first son. Maybe, what do, is, the, uh, is the single person harder to reach uh, in terms of? Uh, yes, absolutely. Caregivers, no matter who you're caring for, have a sense of um, they need to protect someone and take care of someone. So they're much, they're like the target, target audience, but they're most of the population, right? So that's great. And so we kind of have that middle ground where we have these college and high school kids who are invincible, right? And we've got to teach them differently too. So we're looking at mobile apps and things that make it more fun for them so that they'll have the knowledge still, even if they don't always want to take it. I'll kick in here now, yeah. Boy Scouts of America who spend an awful lot of time with the concept of be prepared. Um, if you want to reach young people, um, then have the Boy Scouts who have a whole lot of very young people who have been taught how to be prepared. And my own son um, was a scout and he has his own bug out bag. Imagine that. We didn't have to teach him that. I'm gonna have to uh, Google uh, bug out bag. <laughs> so that shows you my level, I guess. But uh, it's I, the emergency bag that Gary and, and the other. If you need to, if you need to bug out. If you need to bug out, you have something to take care of yourself. Um, ours is set up for 72 hours. Um, we're young yet. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, guys. I appreciate all your time, ladies and gentlemen. I should say.